sorry. Next time, bring uh, just plain drinking water. That'll be fine. Thank you. So we can drink water in here? Yeah, water is fine. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to get started yeah. with the class. You know, it looks like this is a good time to take roll. I hope it's not because of the highway, you know, or, you know, any local flooding. Um, because I'm seeing about, I'm just guesstimating maybe 20-ish people right now. <laughs> so half the class is missing. I just printed out the current roster of this class. We are supposed to have like 44 students or so. So even though this is a relatively big classroom, I think the number of occupants is written somewhere in this room. <coughs> so I think participants, 48 right there. 48? OK. So we should be about you know, close to filling up the entire classroom with you know, 44, 45 students with only three seats you know, available. <laughs> uh, right now, we have about half of those uh, around here. OK, I'll pass this you know, row sheet a little bit later. Uh, what we'll do instead is I'll just go ahead and uh, take a second look at the homework assignment um, because it is due on Thursday, okay, and on Thursday we'll also have our practice exam um, so that we know, you know what kind of questions I'll be asking on next Thursday. Yep, go ahead. The practice exam is worth no points. Uh, it's really, you know, as, the name, as the name implies, it is only for practice purposes. So what I'll do is I'm going to dig up, you know, uh, maybe a past exam, you know, from the last semester. So it's going to be the actual exam one in the previous semester. It's not like watered down or anything like that. Um, so you know, so we can use it as, a, as an opportunity to look at the type of question that I'll be asking, and also the scope, you know, what kind of question or what kind of material you need to know for this particular exam. All right. Um, so are there any other questions before we take a look <coughs> at the uh, current homework assignment that is due on Thursday? No questions? Okay. Yep, go ahead. I know when you do the homework assignment, you don't want to give us like, all the information, you know, but when you <laughs> give us examples, um, okay. Um, I guess you could say in a way misleading because they're way different than Okay. <coughs> okay. Well, let's take a look at the assignment first, and then I can give you, you know, a, a few examples, um, maybe. All right. So here is, I think this is your homework assignment. Does it look about right to you? Okay. I just want to make sure that I did not, I did not bring up um, the homework assignment of the 10:30 class because they have a slightly different homework assignment. Um, so this is your homework assignment. Um, what you need to do is to do all the steps that I talked about last Thursday. Okay, so remember on last Thursday, you know, I go through you know, step one, step two, step three, and so on. So there are several things that are key to what you need to do. Um, in this case, you know, there are there, a few people ask me the question, you know, what is J and what is K? And the answer is, one, you know that they are independent variables. In other words, the value of J and the value of K, um, they are independent to everything else in this particular program. Two, we know that J does not appear on the left-hand side, nor does you know, K, they do not appear on the left-hand side of any assignment statement in this particular pseudocode. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, beyond that, you know, the actual value of J and K should not matter at all. We are not tracing this code. We do not need to know the exact value. We are using pre and post conditions to try to find out, okay, how how would you know the, the variables x, y, j, and k relate to each other after line four. That's basically what we want to do. Alright? So are there any questions about you know, the that particular aspect of the homework assignment? <coughs> Like, you don't want to trace it because that's not what the question is asking. But like, if you were, I guess my question is, if you were to, if it is possible to trace it and you were to trace it, would that completely throw throw you, me off? I you would not get any points because that's not what I'm asking. But would it help? Would it help? Yeah. That's it's a question only you can answer. <laughs> because you know, I I never really looked at it that way. Oh. Um, 
I, I just say that because, like, for example, prime one, it, you know, x, x you change to j, whatever value of j would be x. So, right. Is that important? You know, on the next line, sort of. Yeah. Well, maybe. <laughs> but, yeah. So you have to kind of think about it. You you have to um, kind of think about how each line affects you know other lines. Okay. Without using the formality that we talked about last Thursday, you need to look at the sequence of assignment statements and say, okay, does this affect other statements? Does, it, does this affect other statements? But the point of uh, pre and post condition derivation <coughs> is you only have to focus on one line at a time, on one statement at a time. So in other words, when you're working on statement number one, you don't have to think about statement two, three, or four. You, know, you just focus on statement one. When you work on statement two, there's one brief instant you have to say, okay, how does this relate to statement one? Because otherwise you won't get the precondition to start with. But once you have the precondition of line two to begin with, then it is by itself, it is independent to all of the other lines. Because now you have a precondition, you have an assignment statement, we talked about how to derive the post condition of an assignment <coughs> statement given the precondition last Thursday. So you apply those techniques to line two and line two only, and then you work on line three exactly the same way. Yes, go ahead. The issue that I'm having with this is line one, for example, it seems like it's already at its base. Like I can't do anything else with it. It, it seems like it's done to me. It, what? It says, what am I supposed to do with line one? If that's what's confusing. Getting started with it is, is the issue. Okay. So are you talking about how to derive the post condition of line one in this case? <coughs> well, you follow the steps that we talked about on Thursday. So what was the first step that you need to do as far as we, what we talked about on Thursday? Define it. Define it. To define what is the right, left-hand side, what is the right-hand side. Now that is step one already, right? Step one is just look at the assignment statement itself, figure out what is the left-hand side, figure out what is the right-hand side. Now, when we talk about right-hand side, left-hand side is relative to the left arrow symbol itself, right? So when you look at the statement, you know, it should tell you which one is the right-hand side and which one is the left-hand side. Step two is actually <coughs> the most difficult one. Step two asks you, inverse. if you look at, okay, go ahead. It's for the inverse. Right, you define the function f so that the right-hand side becomes, you know, the actual definition of, uh, in this case, f of x. So now you look at you know f of x being j, and then you say, well, is there an inverse function? In other words, is there a way to reverse this operation? Yep. And on, on that, <coughs> if you're not <coughs> saying it's a function, like if there's no x, and then you define like, like you, you like on line two. I'm sorry. Okay. Like on line two, you're not saying look for the function. It's just if we see that there could be a reciprocal, that makes it a function. No, you, you just follow the steps. You just have to do exactly what the steps tell you to do. Okay, I'm going back to the notes on last Thursday, which is the 27th. And this is the 9 o'clock class. So I'm just going to locate you know, the portion that I think is relevant. Okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. So now we have all the steps you know spelled out here. All right, so let's let me let me just pause here, <coughs> maximize the screen, and make sure that we use the highest possible resolution. I think at some point I'm going to teach classes like this, you know, just use all my videos and just like <laughs> play the questions, pause, answer the question, and play again. You know. <laughs> Especially when they try to say that I have to have closed captioning for everything. Well, if I have close, ca if I spend all the time to put closed captioning on everything, I'm going to use it in my face-to-face -face classes too. <laughs> I call that a modality inversion. 
because they keep saying, you know, well, you know, this is how you teach online classes. This is how you teach online classes. Well, I'm going to apply what I use for online classes for my face-to-face -face classes too. <coughs> yep. When I think of too, like the whole thing about the for forget function, like I understand it, but with it being, it makes more sense to me, to me like in the middle of the code, like yeah. the, like for line, let's say for line one for this one, like yeah. there's nothing before that. It's just true. Well, it is still true, right? I mean, there's still a precondition. The precondition is still, is still an expression, right? You know, true by itself is still an expression. Um, so you can still apply the forget operation on. Okay, so a, even if nothing's been. Yep. You just you just okay. blindly apply these operations, you know, mechanically. The okay. only part that is not mechanical is step two. Step two is the only part that is not mechanical. So let's go ahead and <coughs> review these steps here. Okay. Um, what I and what I was trying to do on Thursday was to give you <coughs> a template to get everything done without having to look at each and every independent assignment statement completely differently. So I was trying to give you a template where you can follow, you know, just steps. Okay, follow step one, step two, and then you can go for either three A or three B, and then three A one after three A, and then three B one after three B. So I was trying to give you a, you know, like a really mechanical you know, procedure to follow in order to derive the post condition. So I'm going to go over this part you know, just, to, uh, just a little bit today. The first part is define uh, f the function. You know, this is to define the function f itself. We use the variable on the left hand side as the independent variable inside the parentheses and then we use the expression on the right hand side as the actual definition of the function. So does everybody understand what step one is about? It is about identifying what is the left-hand side, which is our variable, independent variable, and identify what is the right-hand side. You just <coughs> grab whatever is on the left-hand side of the statement, stick it into the parentheses. You grab whatever is on the right-hand side of the left arrow and put it onto the other side of the definition, and you have step one done. Is that quite OK? Yeah. It's syntactically just breaking up different parts and then use those parts to define function f. The function f is really just a name so that later on we can refer to it and say, well, do we have an inverse function of function f? Yes, we do. You know, fun f prime you know, or the inverse function is this, or no, you know, f does not have an inverse function. So we can just refer to it instead of saying, you know, keep on referring to the entire expression. So it's a shorthand for the entire expression. <coughs> Yep, go ahead. So are we doing that for every line? Yes. So, so let's say well, you have your word processor, it's really, so it really is not that much typing. So we do have to apply this to all four lines in the pseudocode. You have to so follow the same steps. <coughs> say so again? Once you're done with one line, you can just jump to the next one and then do the same thing. Well, let's, let's worry about that next. Okay, you know, but we focus on one line at a time. So right now, we focus on line N. With where n can be line one, two, three, or four. Okay, but we focus on one line at a time. Can we change the font to like earlier so it's easier? You can change the font you know, as long as it is still legible. Like right. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, and not not clean on. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So if you have A on the left and B on the right, and it's B is changed to A, there's no reverse of that. Because the because variable. Okay, so you're talking about which one is on the left hand side, Leah? A. a is on the left hand side. Okay. Well, you look at this expression here. Does it mention A? No. Well, there you go. If it does not mention it, it does not stand a chance of having an inverse. So, so it has to be something <coughs> that a is equal to a plus b, however. Well, if you look at this, is it reversible? Yeah. Assuming b does not change, this is reversible, I mean, obviously. Yep. So that's why it's important to see, to know the both pre and post, right? Because if b, like on, on the top one, if, uh, if B changes, oh, I forget. I don't want to ask. Okay, but we only focus on one statement yeah. at a time. So if B changes before, yeah. it's okay. If B changes after, it's okay. It does not affect how we derive the post condition when we are only dealing with this particular statement. Yes, go ahead. Um, I think where I'm a little confused is where we do the forget. Um, we do, okay, let, let's finish step two first, and then we'll decide we'll, which one to use. Yep, go ahead. So on step two, <coughs> it says uh, find an inverse function. So if there is no inverse function, do we put anything on step two? In step two, then you say there's no inverse function. Okay. Yeah, so you can either say, you know, f prime or the inverse function <coughs> is as follows, or you say there's no inverse function. f prime does not exist. Is that part okay? Because I, I think the later part of this video, you know, I went through two examples. One where the inverse function does exist, and the other one where the inverse function does not exist. Yes. So you want to refer to those and find out, you know, how I write it down. And you, if you want to kind of make sure that you follow exactly the same format and no point is taken off because you're using something else and you're missing certain steps, just follow all the steps that I do in my exam. Um, you're doing this using a word processor, which means you're not really spending a lot of time writing, you're just typing. Uh, for most people, you know, I certainly is one of those, you know, I can type a whole lot faster than I can write. So when it comes to typing, you know, you know, having more content is not a big issue. And I'm pretty sure this is still not as much typing as your English paper class, right, your English writing class. <coughs> Um, and this is far more mechanical. When you think about you know, this assignment compared to your writing you know, homework assignment for English, this has almost no requirement of creativity. In fact, I would say creativity may not be a good trait when it comes to this kind of homework assignment. <laughs> All right, yep, go ahead. Um, I'm not trying to skip ahead, I just have a question that kind of involves that. But So if there's, Six lines of code, mm -hmm. right? Are we supposed to do line one, all six steps, and then line two, all six steps? No, it's not going to be all six steps because by the time you get to step three, you choose one of the two. You cannot be applying 3A and 3B at the same time because when you look at the description of 3A, it only applies when an inverse function was found in step two. Okay. If you cannot find an inverse function, then you have to use <coughs> you know, 3B. So 3 and 3B, is you only choose one or the other. So if, say it's B, so you would do step one, step two, then 3B. Right. And then 3A1. No, 3B1. Three three That's why three it's B named 3B1. Okay. So you would do four of them. Now would you do line one and then the four steps and then line two? Yeah, I would do that. Okay. Yep. And you can even copy and paste, you know, something, you know, in, in the document. Just mm -hmm. make sure you update the line numbers correctly. Okay. okay. Um, so I, so okay. So now we're getting back to you know step two. At the end of step two, you will have a conclusion whether there is an inverse function or not. If there, if there is an inverse function, <coughs> what is it? Okay. So that would be the result of step two. Now after step two, then you have to choose one of the step threes. You have to choose either step three a if an in, in inverse function was found in step two, or you have to use step three b if an inverse function does not exist. So now you have to explain to me, just use exactly the same wording here, and say an inverse function does not exist, therefore we're using the forget operation. Just say that, okay? 
So if so, either way, you have to use you know one of the uh, two rules here, uh, but not both for sure. And I'm going to okay. So I'm pausing right here. The template of the substitution rule is three A one, and the template of the forget operation is three B one. Okay. Question. Okay. Question. <clears throat> in 3A1, we are using the substitution operation, and that's basically a template. Remember what N stands for? N stands for the line number that we are dealing with. So that's basically all that we are dealing with is, is, is line number. So it can be line 1, 2, 3, or 4. So the post condition of a particular line is based on, in this case, the substitution operation applied to the precondition of the same line. Which makes sense because that's what we want to do is to start with a precondition of a particular line and come to the conclusion of the post condition of the same line. <coughs> and it stands for the uh, line number? Line number, yes. Um, and then there are three components to the substitution operation. Yep, go ahead. I had a question. <coughs> On the homework on line one, it's like J goes to X as the assignment statement. X go X gets J's value. J, right. um, so what are we supposed to say that the the pre the pre condition of that is? The pre one is given to you in the assignment. It just says it's okay. true. Yeah. Then that, that that's what it is. Okay. But you still apply the same operation. Whichever one you feel is applicable is the one that you have to apply the operation to. Okay. Okay. So so let me get back to that one. Yep. Go ahead. It looks like the post condition of line two the same as the precondition for line three? Yes. Okay. You kind of have to mention that, you know, because, you know, otherwise you cannot link. <coughs> if you can just go from the precondition to the post condition of a line, then you cannot link, you know, all the statements together. So you have to have a mechanism to link statement one to statement two, statement two to statement three, to statement three to statement four. I believe my example may have an illustration of that as well. What's, what's more, I mean, I know you have to put both of them, but if you were to put a post condition, for example, of three, uh, a precondition of three, you're including the post condition of two, right? If they are sequential, yes. If, if line two and three are sequential, which means oh. that one always leads to the other one, then the post condition of line two becomes the precondition of line three. It's included in the precondition. I wouldn't say include it, it's just that three three is post two because those two lines are sequential. Yeah. Yep. I, uh, for step three B one in the homework it uh, the pre for one is equals T. How yeah. would you write that? Like then you just say it's T. Pre or just forget T? Nope. Nope, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. Uh, let me explain what forget is all about first and then you can you will find out what to do with it. And you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I get, my question is also on the homework because at a certain part you have J, K, and X. Yeah. And so, um, and I believe that it's um, a three A one step. And so I don't really, I don't really know how to do it because I think it's saying Y gets S prime or Y or whatever. You know how we kind of well, I don't know how to explain it without like saying, you know, you pretty much don't want to go over the answer for the homework, so I don't really know how to say it, but... Well, let's see if the example here can help you, can help, help illustrate it, okay? It's the same one as last one. Yeah, this is exactly the same one. But I'm re-explaining it, hopefully, in a slightly different way. Okay. So step 3A, 3A1 is the template of using the substitution operation. The substitution operation has three components. The first one is the precondition itself, which is you know, what are we working on? What are we changing? What are we making the modifications to? The second component is the left-hand side of the assignment statement, which turns out to be the same as our independent variable in the function definition. Is that okay? So you can see how LHS on the left-hand side appears you know, it is in the expression, in the uh, assignment statement itself here, but it is also used to define the function, and once you have the inverse function, it is also used here, you know, because we want to substitute every occurrence of the variable 
on the left hand side would the inverse function apply to that variable? Yep. Um, so taking the example of the whole thing, just that the fact that pre line one is just true, mm -hmm. and then you use one of these, and all you have to do for when it says pre n is just put true? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. The pre n or pre the pre one is true and it calls for pre one in either one of these, then you just put T over there. Okay. And then you apply the substitution operation. Right. But how or the forget operation. Right. But how do you apply the substitution operation just to a statement that's true? You you still do it exactly the same way. Whenever you see the variable mentioned here, you replace it with the f prime or the inverse function applied to the same variable. If you do not find it at all, there's nothing to do. Okay. okay. The substitution operation is really just saying that you know every time you see something like this, change it to that. But if, what if you don't find it at all? Well, don't do anything. There's nothing to change that. Is that okay? Right. Okay, so let's move on to 3B1, which is the forget operation. The forget operation, this is not the entire thing. I have to kind of finish this too. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now we have the entire thing. Um, if you apply the forget operation, this is the template of the, of the forget operation. The forget operation basically says the post condition of a line, which in this case is line one, I just scanned to represent the line number, is based on the forget operation applied to the free condition of the same line. What we are forgetting is everything that mentions LHS in it, okay, the left hand side variable in it. And on top of that, we can also state something outside of the forget operation, which is the left hand side equals to the right hand side. How do we know the left hand side equals to the right hand side after the assignment statement? Because it's assignment statement. It changes whatever is on the left hand side, which is a variable, to the same value as the expression on the right hand side. So are we doing okay so far with the um, rationale of 3B1? The forget operation. Yeah, well, I did an example already, so we'll go through that one say, single example and see if there are any questions. Yep. When you use the forget, um, do you still change the ends to, like, for example, the ends to a T? Or <coughs> pre N. Keep the ends. The ends? You said that um, you changed the ends in the equation to a T using the No, same. I did not say that. That's what you I said pre N can, somebody mentioned that in your homework assignment, the precondition can be just T or true. So yes, sometimes you know pre end is just true itself. But if you it's don't change it. Hmm? But you don't change it? You don't change it. In three B one or three A one? You do not change it. Does T mention anything about a variable? Is true the name of a variable? No. No? Then you, then the substitution operation cannot apply to it? Can you forget it? Well, you cannot forget it either because it does not mention the variable on the left-hand side of the assignment. Yep. I thought true was just true and you didn't have to write it again. No, you have to write it. I mean, you know, if true is the precondition, then it is the precondition. Well, you I wrote it in the theme, but like for post one, I thought that we went through this whole long explanation that true equals true, so just we know it's true. And that's it, and we didn't have to write T anymore. For a previous assignment, so yeah. that's kind of. Does anybody remember? Only if it's true and x, then we can only write. X. Only if it is true and whatever, then you can simplify to whatever. Okay. Okay. I that simplification right. only applies when true appears on one side of the conjunction operator. Okay. 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 So it's not universally applicable. It's not like every time you have true, then you can just ignore that. It's only when true applies the, uh, appears on one of the sides of a conjunction operator, then you can do the simplification. In other words, true is kind of like one in arithmetic. So when you say one times x, then you might as well just say x, because one times whatever is whatever. 
but you cannot just say, oh, since you know this expression is one plus something, we'll just ignore the one. You know that does not you know happen like that. All right. Any other questions before we move on? Yep, go ahead. Uh, once we do uh, three a one or three b one, and we're going to write down, we'll say uh, line three. Uh, I will show you exactly what steps you have to go no, through. No, I just wondering when we say pre uh, pre three equals post two, can we uh, the next line say pre three equals, and we just copy paste them? Where <coughs> the post two is, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. So I'm going to try to fast forward myself here. And it's not letting me fast forward. You're not on it. Aren't you hmm? in the document? No. No, this is, a, this is a part of the recording. Oh, really? And it's just there. It's that clear. Yep. And this is paused. This is playing. The internet is not down yet, <laughs> but it is very slow, and I can't see the the little it's thumbnail thing. Counting. It's yeah, it's counting because well, I can see it's counting too because it, uh, it's blinking. Mm -hmm. The cursor is blinking, you know, because that's a part of the recording. You know, the, the I cannot be playing the recording, you know, if the blink the cursor is not blinking, right? Okay. It's just that you know, like was explaining something at the time and. I want to kind of fast forward. Okay, let me try this. There we go. All right. I want to you know, finish the whole thing first, and then I can go back and talk about how those steps are applied. There we go. Stop. Stop. Okay. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So let's take a look at line 45. In other words, we are looking at this portion of the code, okay? You know, forget about 24, we are not quite at 24 yet. Okay, starting with line 45. Okay, line 45 is an assignment statement. It basically is x gets x plus one, okay? Um, so we follow the steps that were basically prescribed earlier. Step one is just to define what exactly is the function, okay? The function x, the function f applied to x is x plus one. How do I know that? It's just breaking up the assignment statement into two parts. The left-hand side, which is x, goes to here, which becomes the independent variable of the function. The right-hand side, which is this part here, goes to the definition of the function because you know that's how we want to break it up and define function f. And that's step one. Okay, step one is really that, just that. Step two is to attempt to find an inverse function f prime for function f. So you look at the expression here, x plus one. Does it mention the variable on the left hand side? Yes. It does. Okay. So you have a chance that this is reversible, or an inverse function does exist. That is not always the case. You know, for instance, if I have x minus x, then an inverse function does not exist. But if I have x plus x, an inverse function does exist. <coughs> so in this case, an inf inverse function does exist. And in fact, you know, the inverse function is defined as f prime of x equals x minus 1. Because x minus 1 is going to undo what x plus 1 is doing. And here, I have even a proof. This is the only step that you can skip, is you don't have to prove to me that f prime is, in fact, an inverse function of the function f. However, if you skip this step, and somehow you got the wrong inverse function, I will take points off. Okay, so for your own benefit, it might be helpful to also perform this step to convince yourself that f prime is a valid inverse function of f. Is that okay? So it's only for your own benefit. You can you know, skip this step if you want to, but you do have to identify what the inverse function is in step two, or you can conclude it does not exist. In the next example, it does not exist. So we'll go forward and move on to step 3a. Ste in step 3a, it is just a conclusion. An, in an inverse function exists from step 2, use the substitution operation. Because I need to know why you choose to use the substitution operation. And 3a explains exactly why. Because I found an inverse function for the right hand side of the assignment statement. So are we still doing OK so far? Step 1, step 2, and 3a at this point. 
So after 3A, then we have 3A1, which is you know, just you know, the template of applying the substitution operation. So in this case, the uh, substitution operation looks like this. We're dealing with line 45. So the post condition of line 45 is the result of using the substitution operation on the precondition of line 45. That's the first component you have to specify in a substitution operation. The second part of the substitution operation is the variable x itself. In other words, what are we looking for when we are using the substitution operation? If you're not used to the term, you, if you're not used to the term substitution, you can basically say it is find and replace. What are we finding and what are we re replacing it with? Okay? The second component, x, is what we are finding. The third component, which is f prime of x, is what we are replacing it with. Are we doing okay so far with the first line of 3A1? Yes? That was my question, is if I know what, if I know I'm replacing the variable with what f of prime is, or f prime is, what if the precondition doesn't have that variable? Then uh, what? The, the, what do you think? I don't know, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 okay, let me let me just give you an example then. Okay, yeah. so let's say we are doing a substitution operation, and the precondition for whatever reason is a is less than b, and b equals to forty plus c, and that's it. Okay, and my instruction to you is to say, go through this expression, find every single occurrence of x and replace every single occurrence of x with x minus 1. If that is my instruction to you, what are you going to do? I don't know. You don't sub anything because x right. doesn't occur. Then right? you have nothing to do. Right, but so then what is the post at the end? Then, how do you then you have that? the original thing back. Okay. Then you have You're just a is less than b, and b equals 40 plus c. You get the entire thing back just the way it was because the substitution operation took place, except it didn't do a single thing, because there's nothing here that mentions x, which is what you're looking for to replace. Right. In other words, this is the same thing that happens when you use a word processor, and you use the find and replace function, and you say, okay, I want to find something that does not exist in the document. The search and replace will still happen, except it doesn't do anything, because the target string was not found. Okay, so far? Yeah, that answers my question. All right, very good. But are there any other questions about this aspect of the substitution operation? No questions? All right. So, but in this case, you know, we do have something to replace because um, I give you the precondition of line 45 to be x is less than y and y equals to z plus 20 which is actually pretty close to what I have in the example. Um, and the inverse function is um, x minus 1. So that means you know, I have to replace this mentioning of x here with x minus 1. And that's why we got you know, x minus 1 is less than y. And y gets you know, z plus 20. And I, cl I miss one close parenthesis right here. There should be another close parenthesis right there. But we have to kind of remind ourselves why are we doing this substitution operation. It has to do with if there's an inverse function, we can reverse the operation. In other words, we can undo the effect of the assignment statement. Now the nice thing about being able to undo the effect of the assignment statement is if we knew something about how the variable on the left hand side relates to all of the other stuff before the statement, now we can say about the same thing, except now we can say, if you reverse what the statement did to this particular variable, we can still say that this you know, undone version of the variable relates <coughs> to all of the other variables in this particular way. That is the reason why we have the substitution operation. So the essence or the meaning of the substitution operation is actually just as important if not more, than the mechanical steps of performing the substitution operation. Is that part okay? The rationale of the substitution operation? Not really? Not really? Okay. 
So I, let me explain that part because that really is the mo more important part. Okay, in this case, okay, in, in this example, line 45, for whatever reason, 345 is already derived. And which means when line 45 is about to execute, I know this. I know x is less than y, and I know y is z plus 20. Now, we don't want to ask why that is the case, because you know, it comes from the derivation of the previous 44 lines. Okay. We know that line 45 is just adding 1 to the value of x. Is that okay? So we want to find out, okay, now that we have added 1 to x, x is now 1 more than what it used to be, can I still say something about x and how it relates to other variables? That is the question. That's the post condition of line 45. Is that okay so far? You know, what, what, line, what post 45 is really about? Okay, what do we know about these variables? Well, you can say, well, since we changed x, you know, everything that we knew about x, we have to forget, okay? But that's really a kind of lazy approach to it because we do not have to throw away information, okay? Instead, what we can do is to say, well, <clears throat> in the post condition of line 45, the value of x is really just one more than what it used to be. And I know before I do the increment, x used to be less than y. So if I subtract 1 from x after line 45, I get back to the old value of x before line 45 executes. And what did I know about that value? It was less than y. Was less than y. Exactly. So that's why the substitution operation works the way it is, it does is so that we can reestablish the relationship of the value of the variable with everything else prior to this statement by using the inverse function applied to the variable that we are changing. Yes? So uh, what would you say then in the case where x is, like we change the 345 to x is greater than y, and we subtract 1 now, what can we say about that? Same thing. That x minus 1 is still greater than y? Yep. And it makes sense. If x used to be greater than y, mm -hmm. right, and you add 1 to x, then you can say not only that x is greater than y, but x minus 1 is also greater than y, which is telling me more than just saying x is greater than y. Okay. Because it's more precise. That's exactly you know, what it is about. So I'm hoping that you, know, you guys are understanding not <coughs> only the mechanical aspect of applying the substitution operation, but also the rationale of the substitution operation. Because understanding the rationale of the operation itself is going to tell you exactly what to do if the, what if you know, the precondition of line 45 does not mention anything about x? Well, you do exactly the same thing, except there's no x to replace. But everything else would still be kept because you didn't change any of the other variables. Oh, tip rope. Thank you. And this is the early class. There you go. All right. So are we okay with steps, you know, uh, step 3A1, the first line? Okay, the second line is derived from the first line. Now, how do I get to uh, get from the first line to the second line? The first part is I just expand what is pre-45. Pre-45 is given to me like this. So I just expand 345 to x is less than L, to x is less than y and y equals to z plus 20. Is is that okay? Does everybody understand how I just expand the precondition into its, you know, into a conjunction? Okay, it's just substitution. It's just you know expanding you know the precondition. X is x. Okay, so the second component does not change. The third component. In the previous line, it is really just a symbolic reference to the inverse function applied to the variable. But since you already know from here that the inverse function is x minus 1, I just put it here and say, well, you know, now we know exactly what f prime is. Let's go ahead and use that expression. From line 1 to line 2, it is just you know, expanding what we already know so that we can carry out the actual substitution operation. The third line is the result of the substitution operation. Um, and as I said a little bit earlier, I missed one close parenthesis right here. Uh, basically, I find this x here, which is what we are looking for. 
and I replace it with the replacement string or replacement text, which is x minus 1, and that's it. That's the entire operation. Yep? This example is um, one line, so line 45, right? Now, if there's two lines or three lines of code, or uh, are they related in any way? They are related in the, in the only way where the post condition of a line prior is the precondition of the line after. Okay. Because you know, if those lines are sequential, like the ones in your homework assignment, then the post condition of line n becomes the precondition of line n plus 1. Okay. But it only applies when they are truly sequential. Yep. So if they are truly sequential, can we still have to stay full of this what's there and this pre here just to maintain that kind of link? Yes, you do have to kind of mention and say, you know, pre three equals post two, you know, because the lines are sequential. You have to kind of spell it out a little bit. Uh, because otherwise there's no no linkage between the post condition of one statement to the precondition of whatever is following. So it is important to kind of make a note and say, okay, you know, I know that they're related. But you don't have to spell out the entire expression again if you don't want to copy and paste it. Well, I mean, that's well that point. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I think it is important, an important step, you know, so that we know why they are related. All right. So now that you know, 45 is done, which is an example of the application of the substitution operation, let's go ahead and move forward with uh, line 24, which is an application of the forget operation. I'm just going to. Let this go through this part, and some more. Oh, by the way, has anyone looked at the uh, captioning? Turn on the uh, closed captioning. It's funny. <laughs> has, <laughs> hmm? Yeah, but it's yeah, it's not really exactly uh, accurate. Say again. Yeah, YouTube has an automated thing to do it. It's probably the same thing that you use, you know, when you use um, Google to text somebody. You can actually just say it and not um, not type it. Like you can do it with Siri too. You can you know, use Siri in on an Apple you know, device to type something just by talking. Yep. Well, just thinking about it, I kind of thought it was funny that if I watch the video for today, I'm watching yeah. a video of a video on YouTube. <laughs> yes. And then if there are any questions on next Tuesday, you'll be watching a video with a video in it. <laughs> well, well it's, it's, the perfect, it's a perfect example of nesting. <laughs> yep. We have a holodeck in a holodeck in a holodeck. Can I ask a random question right. about Go ahead. when before this? On and it could just be that maybe it's implied, but why is it that for the post condition of 45 that we don't also say that x minus 1 is less than z plus 20? So it's because it's kind of implied. Because right? y has nothing to do with x. Okay. Well, y is an entirely different variable. But I mean, we're already making the, we're already saying x minus 1 is less than oh, y. Oh, making the inference. But yeah. there's no need for you guys to make the inference, you know, because, you know, it's not required. So does it? It is true that x minus 1 is less than, you know, z plus 20. But since we know that y is, you know, z plus 20 and x is x minus 1 is less than y, <coughs> so that can be inferred. Okay, so it's just kind of implied then at that point. Right, it okay. is implied. Yep, that's a good point. So let's take a look at line 24, which is an example of applying the forget operation. <coughs> so on line 24, this is my left-hand side, which is x as an independent variable. This is my right-hand side, become, which becomes the definition of function f. So you can see how the left-hand side goes into the parentheses. The, the right-hand side goes to the other side of the definition of function f. That's step one. So step one, you know, should be pretty easy to do. It's just copying one portion to another portion. Step two is basically saying, you know, do we have an inverse function? In this case, there's no inverse function because function f is mapping every possible value to a single value of 20. 
So if you start from the single value 20, there's no way for you to tell how did I, how did I get here. Okay, you cannot pinpoint and say, oh, you know, we end up with a value of 20 because the original value of x is 6. No, you cannot say any you cannot say anything conclusively. So that's why in this case, um, x does not appear on the expression of the right hand side, and so it does not have an inverse function. Now, because in step two, we make that conclusion of f does not have an inverse function, we move on to 3b and say, OK, since it does not have an in inverse function, we have to use the forget operation. The application of the forget operation starts with 3b1, which is a template. The template is just like you know, what we talked about earlier. Um, the post condition of that line, of that statement, depends on the forget operation applied to the precondition of the same statement. And this time, anything component that contains the variable x, we have to get rid of it because you know that may no longer be true. But after you perform the forget operation, you also have to remember that x equals to 20 from now on because the effect of line 24 is just that. x becomes 20. So are we doing OK so far with the first line of 3b1? So with the forget operation, we're saying we're removing any instances of x? In an we are removing all comparisons that involves x. All comparisons. All comparisons. Because, you know, because we changed the value of x, and as a result, you know, anything that we knew about x may not apply anymore. And then the second line of the forget, going from the first line of the forget to the second line of the forget, it has to do with, um, we are just expanding what is the precondition of line 24. And since in this particular case, the assumption was pre-24 is x is greater than y and y equals to z plus w, that means you know we just expand it inside the forget operation. The third line is the actual result of the application of the forget operation. Since x is greater than y, mentions the variable that we are supposed to forget inside the forget operation. So we get rid of x is greater than y, and as a result, the operator, the conjunction, is also you know, removed. And as a result, the entire forget operation becomes just y equals to z plus w. But we have the conjunction with x equals to 20 outside of the forget operation. So that part is preserved, and as a result, the conclusion is y equals to z plus w and x equals to 20. If we have y equals z plus x, then we would forget it too? If we have y equals z plus x, then you also have to forget that operation. Then you have uh, nothing left. Then x equals 20. If you have nothing left, you can, that basically is just true too. So you can either say it is true, or you can just have x equals 20. Yep. So for that, you're just forgetting all the all the parts that have x in it? The all the comparisons involving x. OK. And for the homework, it's true. So that's what's confusing me. I don't know what you would write for line 2. Like, would you do just forget t and x equals j? Or? If the forget operation is the one that you need to apply, then you just forget you know, anything that mentions x. If t mentions x, then you forget it. If t does not mention x, then you do not forget it. That's all I can say <laughs> without spelling out the guess. Yeah. Are you saying we forget all the comparisons mentioning x? Uh, what else do we have? Like, that, it's not a comparison that mentions x. Um, what can be something that is not a comparison that mentions x? Uh, assignment. No, we cannot have assignments operations. We cannot have assignment operators as a part of a condition. A precondition has to be a condition, which means it has to be you know, in this class, it has to be based on comparison. So precondition has to be a comparison. Hmm? A precondition has to be a comparison. Not a precondition is a condition. A condition can be a compound condition involving logical operators like uh, and or not. And but when you boil it all the way down, the most basic components that can give you a true false value will be a comparison. So everything has to boil down to comparison at some point when we look at a condition, other than the statement truth itself. All right, so are we still doing okay so far with 
the example, line 24 in this case. Okay. Does everybody understand the rationale of the forget operation? Okay. Because we are changing it, so what we knew about it may not be true anymore. And as a, as a result, we have to remove all everything that mentions the variable that we are changing. The next one, you know, basically it shows you how to link the two statements together. So I'm going <coughs> to skip up oh, too much. Rewind. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, so in this case, you know, I'm not going through the derivation of post 31, and I'm just going through the step here to link the result of line 31 to the assumption of line 32. Okay, so you need to do something like this. In fact, if you want to, you can just type whatever I have here. Just change the line number and be done with it. Are we, yep. step one, step two, step three, A, step three, A one, but all of those items, you know, the information contained within the steps, they should be there. There was a hand earlier. Somebody, um, yep, go ahead. I still can't understand. This very last one, over there, you want to ask after the OR, what is the work to write? Uh, Not after all your work. In order to link the post condition of one line to the pre-condition of the line following, you have to explain that to me. Oh, because that does clean. not apply to all cases. It only applies when a particular statement is sequential to another statement. So that's why it is kind of special and you have to mention it. 3-1 is equal to post, um, no, 3-2 is equal to post-1. Because they are sequential, because those two lines are sequential. So it'd be like if we had, but it wouldn't be necessarily the case with like an if then statement where that is correct. In the if then statement, then it is no longer applicable because if I have line one, if blah blah blah, line two, you know, it doesn't even matter what statement I have here. In this case, it does not follow. Post two does not equal to pre one. Oops, the other way around. Post one does. <laughs> pre two does not equal to post yeah. one. Well, yeah, the other way around. But this does not, it, it doesn't happen automatically because in this case, it is not sequential. It's not sequential because line one could have gone to the else case, right? So line two is not necessarily whatever it should be following line one. And as a result, that argument does not apply anymore. And so we have to treat this case differently and use a different way to derive the precondition of line two, which we also talked about in the class. Right. Are there any questions about your, the homework assignment? Because I think these are all the pieces that you need for your homework assignment. It's just that you want to be as complete as possible when you explain to me why you choose to do it this way and how you expand all of the, you know, how you perform all those individual steps. Right. Are there any questions about this particular homework assignment or the derivation of pre and post conditions? All good? Yeah. All right. Well, this is all getting recorded. Let me just double check and make sure that I am recording an annotated version of a prior recording. Yep. It is being recorded. That's good. 
But this is why I like you know having the the class recorded because you know, I can actually go through the same material, but explain it either differently or in more detail, or you guys can review it and ask me questions about the material of a prior class, and then we can go over that stuff again. Okay. Any other questions before we continue with our lecture material? Okay. Now, just remember, uh, next Thursday, we'll have our first exam, our first midterm. It is open book, open notes, anything that is either printed or handwritten can be bring, you can bring it you know, to help you in the test. Okay. Um, for those of you who want to work together, you know, kind of like you know, study together, it is encouraged that you guys you know, study together and come up with you know the same notes, you know, whatever you want to bring to the class, you know, that's perfectly okay. The only thing that is not permitted is you know writing down something during the exam and then pass it to the next person. Yep. Do you need a Scantron? No, no Scantron is needed. Uh, typically what I do is I leave enough space on the question paper itself. So you just write your answer on the question paper. I collect everything back, I grade it, and I enter the grade into Moodle, and then I pass the papers back to you. Yep. Uh, is it just going to be like a series of problems that we have to figure out? or? Yeah, it's going to be about you know four or five questions, you know, depending on the complexity of the question. There will be, most of those questions will be traces. So you'll be asked to trace a particular program. You will be asked to complete a trace that may be partially done, or analyze a trace and figure out you know what is wrong with that trace. And we won't be doing any of the post or pre stuff, or there will be one question for pre and post condition because I know how much you guys like it, so I'll, give, oh, I'll only give you one. <laughs> Unless you guys request it, I want I want three of those things. Yep. We'll have nested statements. Yes, we will have that. Are there any questions related to the nested statements? Yep. Okay, that's okay. So, so our study guide is uh, on the website. Your study guide is basically everything that you have access to on the on the website. So it's going to be like so our test ones like that, right? So you know, on the exam when it says which this like on the practice test. Mm -hmm. It'll be like that, you know, but on Thursday, you know, I will give you the actual, you know, practice test. Um, I do change my question types from, you know, semester to semester. So for this semester, I might try something new that may not be in the practice test itself. For instance, I might give you a trace that is incorrect, and you guys will have to find out, you know, what is wrong with that trace and fix it which is not a question type that I have used in the past. So I do reserve the right to make any modifications <laughs> and ask any new types of questions. And you had a question earlier. I was going to say that, uh, just to be clear, we will have time in class to conduct the practice exam so we can study Right. Okay. Yeah. Just to make sure. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the third week. That will be one week from this Thursday. And this Thursday is the 6th, so the 13th is the right day. And will you review conjunctions and disjunctions and the meaning, maybe, or? Conjunction and disjunction? Just their meaning, kind of. Conjunction of is and, yeah. um, disjunction is or, and negation is not. Um, you know, I can kind of point out, you know, where we cover that material. That's in topic two when we talked about conditions. So when we talk about conditional statements, we also talk about the uh, logical operators. So that would be conjunction, disjunction, and negation over there. And each one is defined uh, by spelling it out you know, completely. So all possible combinations are spelled out. Now, because you are allowed to bring you know, everything, which includes my notes, okay, and my notes uh, are available in both HTML format as well as PDF format. So that means, you know, in, during the exam, I cannot answer questions of what what is this symbol represent. I cannot answer those questions. I can clarify what a question is asking, but I cannot answer, you know, any questions that is already in the notes. You are assumed to have read the notes already. Yep. Oh, you said how many? We can bring many. 
Well, as, 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 as long as it is physically feasible. <laughs> if, you, if you need enough stuff to fill up the entire table so there's no space for your neighbors, then I would have to probably so ask you no, to. I mean like a few, like a few uh, printed sheets, it's fine. Anything, anything that is either handwritten or printed prior to the exam, you can bring it in to the extent that it does not you know, cause problems with your neighbors. <laughs> the neighboring students, okay. Um, but no electronic devices, okay. No, you know, no PD, no uh, mobile devices or laptop computers. So if you are relying on laptop computers to review the notes, you need to print it out first. Any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and. Are there any questions about nested statements? Because you know that seems like to be one of the things that uh, you guys might have question about. Go ahead. Well, they will be in the exam because you know that's that topic is prior to the pre and post conditions. So we have done, we have talked about that already. Um, may I ask you know what? Part of nested statements, you know, is the is the part that is confusing and you know, kind of, you don't know what to proceed after a certain point. I think the conditional statements you know, makes it harder. Is that the one that? The if then statements in the middle. Is that what you're saying? Like, yeah. That's what made it harder. From the homework. Okay. Standpoint. Point. I think that it made more sense, like when you would jump into something and you would see like assignment right away, like a variable would get an action to do like right away as opposed to going into another if then do this, but then the next line was an if then statement and I found that to be confusing. So it was a little hard to follow. Okay. And not only that, but then we didn't really, even though you said it shouldn't matter, it, mm -hmm. it did matter because logically it's not, I, mean, I haven't seen anything like that, so I didn't okay. understand how to follow the logic of how to loop around in it. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at you know some nested statements, you know, just so that we know how to deal with those. Okay. And I'm not even going to use in any specific example here. I'm just going to use you know C C1 as a condition here. Um, I'll use you know, C2 as another example here. And I'm going to use the right indentation. Uh, here's another thing, you know, I might ask you questions where the pseudocode does not have the proper indentation. But I will still ask you, okay, where do we go from here, assuming these are the values in the variables? So that means you, know, you have to be able to analyze the structure of a program without the proper indentation, and then figure out what, you know, what is you know, the next statement to execute. Yep? Regarding uh, the possible inclusion of uh, intentionally incorrect code, you will clearly state that we're looking for an error. Correct. Right. Yep. Okay. And then we'll have line five being else here. Line six. Let's say we have another conditional statement. So let me just kind of fix all the indentations so they really line up nicely. I cannot stand it when they you know, don't line up you know, really, really nicely like that. <laughs> yep? Um, in regards to the grade book, is there any way we can check our overall grade um, Not yet, because I have to clean it up first. Um, <coughs> but all your homework assignments, you know, everything that we have done up to this point will still be fall into the 20% of the uh, homework assignments. So it's still, you know, we are still working, you know, just within the 20%. Um, how much of this 20% depends on how many more homework, you know, we're going to do for the rest of the semester. But I would say we are probably less than one third through with all the homework assignments. So we are about, I would say about 6% at the most uh, done at this point with as far as your 100% is concerned. Why did you the first um, Well, as long as it is 
lined up with the last one, it's okay. Well, I want to put this space here to separate the line number from the statement itself. But I also want it to line up here, so I need two spaces here just so that this if lines up with this and if. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. So let's let's just you know take a look at this you know hypothetical structure of a program. I'm not even going to tell you what is C1, C2, C3, or statement one, statement two, or statement three. Um, I'm just going to ask you a few questions you know, so that I can help you kind of look at this in a certain way. You know, how do I get to statement three? That's the first question. Okay, how do we get to statement three? In other words. Uh, what conditions have to be true in order to get to statement three? Uh, both C1 and C2 have to be false. C2 is false. No, C1 just has to be false. Okay, <coughs> hey, well, that's a, apparently that's a good question to ask. Very good. <laughs> yep. C1 and C2 both have to be true. Okay, let me show you how I would analyze you know, this problem because I can see that you guys you know, are just you know, using your mind to analyze the problem. But I would probably just you know, do it this way. Okay, statement three is right here. So the question is, how do I get to statement three? Well, the first thing, the most immediate question is, which conditional statement is it in? Where is the beginning of the conditional statement that is cont containing statement three? C3. Okay, line six. Okay, the conditional statement starting on line six, which starts with if C3. But this is the else portion of statement three, right? So that means statement, that means condition three or C three has to be false. False. Okay. Very good. Okay. So that's one thing that we know. So we know that you know not C three has to be true because C three has to be false. What else do we know? Okay. So now you look at this entire conditional statement and say, well, we have to get to this conditional statement in order to get to statement three, but how do we get here? This is the else branch of something. Now how do I know this is in the else branch of something? This is right after the else on line five. It's right after the else and the indentation also you know, tell you that this is the else branch because you know, this entire block is inside, if you look at the indentation of line six to line 10, they are all at least one indentation level embedded into what line five and line 11 has. So once again, the indentation level is really helpful. This is the correct indentation, and as a result, the indentation tells you, you know, this part is the else part of another conditional statement. The other conditional statement is the one that is on the outermost portion, which is uh, starting with C1. So the, now the question is, does C1 have to be true to get to here, or does C1 have to be false to get to what I have highlighted at this point? has to be false because it's the else you're absolutely correct so it's not c3 and not c1 okay what about c2 can we say anything about c2 when it when i am in statement three is it true or is it false it's not true i cannot say a single thing about c2 it is not evaluated i did not get here because of c2 and as a result i cannot say a single thing about the condition c2 it was not on my way here. Is that making any sense? And since I did not evaluate C2 to get here, I cannot say a single thing about it. I cannot say it is true or false. I just did not evaluate it at all. Yep. How about if we ask uh, the question about statement two, then we involve C2? Statement two? Well, let's think about statement two. Okay. <clears throat> So let's go ahead and answer the other question. In fact, we'll, we'll take a look at four questions, okay? Let's take a look at statement two since we are right next door of, of it already. So the, now the question is, how do we get to line seven? The most immediate condition that has to be true or false is C3. Now C3 has to be true because this is in the then branch of that conditional statement. If you look at the nesting level, um, implied by the indentation. Statement two is the then branch of the conditional statement starting on line six because it is between the then and the else of that particular conditional statement. Okay, very good. 
So we know that C3 has to be true. What else do we know? Well, once again, in order to get here, we have to be getting to the else part of the outer conditional statement, which means C1 has to be false. Exactly. Very good. All right. Very good. So next is how do we get to statement 1? C1 has to be true, C2 also has to be true. Because C1 has to be true for me to get to line 2 to line 4, and then C2 has to be true in order for me to get to line 3. So in this case, you know, C1 and C2 both have to be true. Well, I said there were four questions. So what is the fourth one? How do we execute no statement? None of statement. One statement two or statement three. In other words, how do I get through this entire code without executing statement one, statement two, or statement three? If uh, C1 is true, no is true, and C2 is false? That's, that's right. No, C1 is true, C2 is false, will end up with no statement executed at all. Exactly. Okay, so in this case, the answer is. C1 has to be true so that we go to line 2 to line 4 and then um, C2 has to be false so that we do not execute line, uh, line 3. But since there's no else statement corresponding to the conditional statement from line 2 to line 4, it means if it is false, we just do nothing. Is, it, is that helping, you know, with your understanding of how conditional statements are nested and how to interpret you know, all the ifs, the else, and the you know, and ifs. So if line number one is true, then you go to line two. Right. And if it's false, you go to line six. You go to line six, correct. So are there any questions? Line one is true. If C one is true, we jump to eleven. Sorry. C one is true, and we go into line eleven, right? No. You have to do C two first. If line one, if the condition of line one is true, then you proceed to line two because then you have to execute the then branch of that conditional statement. So. Basically, what it means is for every conditional statement, you have to identify three things. Okay? One is what is the condition of the conditional statement. Two, what is the then branch of that conditional statement? What do we do when the condition is true? And three, what is the else branch of the conditional statement? What do we do when the condition is false? Those are the three components that you have to be able to answer or identify when you look at any conditional statement. When you look at condi the conditional statement from line two to line four, it has all three components. Even though one is implied, it is not really spelled out. The first component is the condition. C2 is the condition of that conditional statement. Let me just highlight it so that we know which portion of the program we are looking at. We are looking at this portion here. The first component is what is the condition, C2. What is the then branch of this conditional statement, statement one. What is the else branch of this conditional statement? It is nothing, okay? It, is, it still has an else branch, except there's nothing to do in the else branch in this case. There's no operation that you need to perform in, its else, in the else branch. You can just call it you know, short circuiting, right? You know, you're just going from the condition all the way to the end of the conditional statement. There was another question. Yep. So, so let's say line one is true. It's a conditional statement. It's a one-shot thing. You follow one branch, and then when it's done, you exit the conditional statement. So why would you go back to one point? It is not a while. So after three, you just get redone. After line three, you get to either line 11, or excuse me, line 12, if there is a line 12, or if none, you go to post. So this means, you know, from your question, you know, I can see that, you know, reviewing the material for the while loop 
and the conditional statement will be helpful because you are, you are uh, mixing those two up, which also tells me what kind of question I should be asking. <laughs> All right, so I'll see you guys on Thursday. You'll bring your questions on Thursday, which in case we do have time. Um, I submitted, I remember I told you I submitted my um, trace part of the uh, 